perfume on. She oozed from her inner being that fragrance. If we want to live in God's presence, we must make repentance a part of our daily and moment-by-moment -moment routine. Well, how do we do that? We're so busy, right? Well, we all know when we're doing something we shouldn't do. We all know when our eyes falter and look at something maybe we shouldn't look at. We know. We feel conviction. In that moment is when we say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. When we allow something to slip from our mouth that shouldn't be there, at that moment we say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive, forgive my shortcomings. When we lose our temper with our children or we're just so tired and we're stressed, in that moment we need to ask God to forgive us. When our neighbor next door needs something and needs our help, but we're too busy and we don't want to be bothered, we need to ask God for forgiveness. When our brother or our sister at church needs help and we don't want to answer the phone, God, forgive us. There are so many things in our daily routine that we do, moment to moment, that we need to ask God to forgive us. It's a daily cleansing. Something that we need to be in a routine of doing. See, we don't just do it before we step out the door on Sunday morning. It's something that we need to be doing every day, moment by moment, in order to be in the presence of the King. It's something we should breathe in and pray it out. Rub it in deep into our being and to remove the impurities and soften our heart and attitudes and ingest it to cleanse our inward parts. The role of myrrh in the Old Testament sacrifices, and in Jesus' life, the death in the burial paints a vivid picture of killing the old man, removing the blemishes, purging the inner recesses, and turning away from old practices, habits, mindsets, and limitations. It speaks of change, cleansing, sanctification, and preparation for the appearance before the King of Kings. Most people don't like change. Ugh, it's uncomfortable. I like the way things are going. I like the way they're moving. Well, I praise God that I, I sit underneath a pastor that is not afraid of change. I thank God for that. I'm inspired by that. Not many pastors are like that. Change is good. If you want something different, you have to do something different. You cannot sit in a pew every Sunday, sitting there doing nothing, expecting God to move in your life if you're not moving. We want God to move, but we don't want to move. I don't want to change. God can change it for me. No, that's not how it works. God wants us to change. He wants us to step out. He is right there. He's been waiting for us all along. But we're too stubborn. We get set in our habits. Our habits. Our habits are sin. They keep us from God. It keeps us from His presence. It keeps us. We're bound by it. God wants us to step out and do something different. If you've never stood in church and you're capable, try standing. It frees you up. It makes you want to step out and dance. It makes you want to raise your hands. It makes you want to do something different. If we're not excited about what God's doing, there's something wrong. God's stirring us. He's saying, step out. Let's be different. Let's believe in what I'm doing. I had a sister a couple weeks ago say something. And it's so truthful. Yes, we pray without ceasing. But when we bring a petition before the king, we believe that he's heard that request, that he's answered that request. We have to stand firm upon that and not move to the right or the left on it. If we know that we know that we know, then it will come to pass. It will come to pass. These are the habits that keep us from God. These are the things that tarnish us. These are the things that stain us.
up our wedding garment. These are the things that are going to keep us from seeing our king of kings. See, we think we have on a sparkless garment and that we're arrayed because we come to church. Oh, we're here. We're here. We've done our part. We're here. Everybody thinks I'm living right. I'm doing right. And I'm not saying you're out doing all kinds of things. But sin is sin. It makes no difference if it's murder or if it's a foul word that comes out of your mouth. Sin is sin. It puts a spot on your garment. We think we're arrayed in white garments. But what are we going to do when we stand before the king and we find out we have spots? What are we going to do? It's going to be too late. We need to make this a moment-by-moment preparation. We need to speak it out of our mouth every day, moment-by-moment. We think as Christians, we think as Christians, and I, I can speak this honestly for my own self. Pastor gives an altar call at the altar. And he might, he might say, well, if you're going through this particular thing, come forward. And for us as Christians, we think, well, if I go forward and I need prayer for this and I go forward for that, everybody's going to think I was doing that. Yes. You know what? God knows what you're going for. Yes. Yes. We need to step out of our little, our little Christian thinking that we allow ourselves and we put ourselves in that little box thinking that God is in that little box with us. We need to step out of that box. And say, you know what? I don't care. I don't care what any of you think. I am going forth. Because I am going to meet my king of kings. I have a need within me. And it's been burning at me all week long. And I need God to answer it. And I need to stand with my brothers and my sisters like-minded. And I need to make my petition known. Because I am the daughter of the Most High God. And I need my prayers answered. And that's what God is wanting from each of you. Is to step forward. To step forward and make your petition known. To let God have His way in your life. Amen. Ephesians 5.27 said that He might present herself, present her to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. Esther also followed the half the first half year of cleansing and purification with myrrh, with another intense six months period of immersion and, and saturation with sweet spice. It's almost certainly uh, included frankincense and several others. The little bottle of anointing oil wasn't by happenstance. It's frankincense and myrrh. Because I believe that we need to anoint ourselves. I have seen change take place by anointing. My children, I have four children, that range be between the age of 18 and 30. And I have four children. And I, over the years, have prayed and anointed Kleenexes. Simple Kleenexes. There is no spiritual significance in a Kleenex. But I would pray over those Kleenexes. I would pray and I would place them under their beds, in their book bags, in their, in their dressers. I would place them in the cars. Anywhere my children would be, I would put one. Not that that Kleenex could do anything, but the fact that I know when I prayed that that covering, that covering, that covering was going to be there. Our bride is going to sit. She is still beautiful sitting down. Every bride needs to take a break now and then. <laughs> Worship covers us with the fragrance of the king. In fact, the real purpose of soaking in the oil of anointing is repentance. It is to camouflage any smell of the flesh. It is what allows the king to stand to be in the same room with us. Unlike myrrh, frankincense only releases its fragrance in the heat of fire. I don't know about you, but I can tell you about some heat in the fire. 
I know what it's like to have trials and tribulations. I know what it's like to be at the hospital and to receive the news that my first grandchild had to have a heart transplant at five months old or he would not make it. I know what that news felt like. I knew. I knew what it's like. I know what it's like. I'm sorry, forgive me. I know what it's like to have a husband die in your arms. To take his last breath. I stand before you an overcomer. Because see, that seed was already planted deep within me. So when those trials came, I could stand. I could stand. You know, it speaks highly when you have the man of God come to you at the hospital. When, when my husband had passed away and they came and they delivered the news. I weeped for a moment. And I said, no. This is what God has prepared me for. It's for a moment like this. I said, bring me my children. My children came in the room and I shared with them what had taken place. And I said, this is when we as Christians will rise up and show that we are different. Yeah. We said our goodbyes. Don't, don't think for a moment we didn't have our tears. We had our tears. But we didn't walk around with our heads sunk down that we could go on. We went to church the next service. We had church. We sang. We kept on with our routines that we did. We continued on. Because a Christian knows that this is not our home. This is just a resting place for us. We are just vessels of God being used here for where we're really going. It's a temporary place. This is not it. It's a resting place for us. It's where God is using us to reach out, to be His arms and His hands extended, to reach out for Him. This is a resting place. In the preparation of both the sacred anointing oil for kings and priests, and for the intense, uh, the incense burning as a sacrifice to God to the Jewish temple, some forms of worship only release their sweet fragrance to God when offered from the fires and trials of adversity. The sacrifice of praise offered in times of trouble is especially sweet and pleasant to the King of Kings. This is worship from a posture of trust and faith instead of suspicion and doubt. Which leads me to Miss Chris, our elders in the church. So often our elders in the church feel left out. Well, I'm not needed. Do you not realize the elders in the church is what brought us to church. Amen. The prayers of the elders. In the Bible, it's not by mistake when it says, gather the elders together to pray and to anoint you. Yes. It is not by mistake. The elders are the ones that are not afraid to bow a knee. They spend hours on hours praying. They're the ones that pray and seek. You're not here by, by mistake. God still needs you in the church. You play an important role. Our young ladies need spiritual moms. We're not here just to come to church. We need to hook up with one of the young ladies and one of the men with one of the young boys in the church and make that your prayer son and your prayer daughter. These are our children. Our elders, our elders have carried the church. You are the role model for our young people. Yes. The elders are the ones that lay out the expectations. If you do not worship, and you do not pray, and you do not seem concerned, why would you think that our young people would be? Why? If we're not doing it, how do we expect them to do it? If there is no standard, when we come to church, we are not supposed to look like the outside world. We're supposed to look different. It's supposed to be different in here. This is the sanctuary of the Most High God. It is different. It is not a place.
place to come and play and goof off. Yes, there's time for that. But when the doors are open and it's time for church, it's time for business. It's time to get in God's presence. And if we are not doing it as the elders, how do we expect our children to do it? But yet we're the first to scold them. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? How dare me? Stand and make judgment on our children and our youth when we are not following through with what God has put before us. How dare us? The elders are crucial. They carry us through their prayers. In the tabernacle in the temple of the ancient Israel, the smoke of the holy incense warped past the veil of separation as a praise offering of sweetness to Jehovah God. And it obscured from view the flesh of the ministering priests. This speaks of the return of pure praise and worship to the place of prominence, once seen in the tabernacle of David and in the temple of Solomon. Our sinful flesh is covered by the blood of the Lamb, and by the sweet-smelling cloud of our worship filling the room. I'm, gonna, I'm honest, and I don't, I'm not here to worry about people's feelings. I believe that God placed me here to speak a word. If our church doesn't rise up, God cannot move. He wants to move, but we don't rise up. I come in, I come in week after week after week, and I am hungry for God. I am so hungry for what God wants to do, because I have been to the Holy of Holies. I have been in that presence. I have smelt that fragrance, that sweet fragrance. I have been there. I have seen miracles take place. God wants to do that here in this church. He wants to do it here. He wants to move. He wants to move in our lives, in our hearts. But we hold them back because we come in and we sit down and we never move from that spot. We never move. It's like we've got Velcro stuck to our backside and once we sit, we don't move. We're expecting results, but we're not doing anything about it. Do something about it. It's time we've got a whole community around us. They're dying and going to hell because we're sitting down not doing a thing about it. We need to get up and be what God has called us to be. It's time to stand and rise up. And if you call yourself a child of the Most High God, then act like a child of the Most High God. It's time to rise up and be who God has called us to be. orphan peasant, but through her per perseverance and preparation, her unequal beauty in ministering to the king and her submission and intercession, she uh, orchestrated and delivered an entire nation. Never underestimate the potential of one service. Never. A soul that walks in that door, that may be the one service that you are meant to do something, that you are meant to pray, that maybe you are supposed to stand up and raise your hands during worship. Maybe you were supposed to do something and you chose to sit there. Never underestimate the potential of one service. Never underestimate the potential of one encounter. Never underestimate the potential of one man or a woman. I have told my youth over the years as a youth pastor, one makes a difference.